Your phone is ringing. You look at the caller ID to see it's your Uncle Jake who owns a fish and chips shack down by the pier. You pick up. It's Uncle Dave, all right. He starts rambling on how he has all this waste cooking oil that he fries the fish and chips in and now suddenly they are forcing him to get rid of it by not flushing it into the bay area and how he has to pay for disposal instead. Setting aside your concerns about the legality of your Uncle Steve's shop, you realize that there is no company in your town to recycle cooking oil. You interject that you, the family nerd, have an idea. You're going to turn that used oil into fuel that Uncle Dick can run his 80s Mercedes S class diesel tank engine on. Super relatable story, wasn't it? Hi, I'm not a chemist and today I'm achieving fame using olive oil. Fame, of course, standing for fatty acid methyl ester. Fatty acid methyl ester, of course, being a type of biodiesel used either as an additive or sometimes just on its own in diesel-powered internal combustion engines, such as diesel cars or diesel burning heaters. This type of biodiesel really quite sucks as a renewable fuel though and we will discuss some of the reasons why. And the monster of the week is transesterification. What this reaction does is to split the triglyceride molecules of vegetable oils right along here and plop a methyl group at the end of each of the three fatty acids here, forming three fatty acid methyl ester molecules and one glycerin molecule from one oil molecule. Pretty good deal if you ask me, and it's quite efficient too. The methoxy group here comes to us from methanol and as a catalyst we can use a base like potassium or sodium hydroxide. So transesterification is really quite easy to set up, but as with any process we have to be aware of some potential pitfalls. In this case there's one other reaction that we want to avoid, the base that we will use as a catalyst would be consumed in driving saponification, that is the creation of soap from the fatty acids in the oil. Hence, even though you could call it overkill, not only did I dry the methanol with molecular sieves, but I also used calcium chloride to try and remove any potential water that might be trapped in the oil. Although you probably wouldn't really need to dry any oil unless it's cloudy, which this one really wasn't. Nevertheless, that's what I did and as such, the next day I ended up having to vacuum filter the oil to get rid of the calcium chloride. And although the calcium chloride step might have been unnecessary, if you for using waste cooking oil, filtering it is basically a must. The used oil is full of additional organic material from foods and stuff and that will affect the end product quality in many negative ways. So we're just going to pretend that this uh, pure olive oil is waste oil that we got and we're going to vacuum filter it now and just pretend that that's the reason we're doing it and not the calcium chloride which I added completely unnecessarily. Now let's talk about squiggles, hydrocarbons and fuels and how they relate to each other. When simplified, all major hydrocarbon fuels being gasoline, kerosene and diesel consist of different lengths of hydrocarbon chains and polygons fractionally distilled from petroleum. All they differ in is the amount of carbon each molecule in the fuel holds. Gasoline, for example, consists of squiggles that, that contain 4 to 11 carbons. Uh, the gasoline is, is, is volatile, it evaporates on its own, and uh, the, the boiling point of all of its constituents is, is lower than or around that of water. Kerosene is used for jet fuel, it consists of 9 to 16 carbon hydrocarbons. It's cheaper to, to produce than gasoline, so planes can use it at scale but it's still thin enough or non-viscous enough so it doesn't like jellify during flight as diesel would. And diesel, the topic of the day, consists of hydrocarbons with 15 to 18 carbons in each squiggle. Uh, these carbon numbers overlap as you might have noticed since they're usually just products of fractional distillation of petroleum and it doesn't make too much sense to, to try and separate them exactly. What, it, what I mean is that uh, if with fractional distillation you only get closer and closer to a pure product with, uh, with each consecutive distillation that you do and you only get there asymptotically so unless there is a necessity to do it at above a certain purity level you just kind of stop when it's good enough. Uh, hence you get overlaps of different carbon chain lengths in different fuels because it's good enough. What makes petroleum fuels uh, special though apart from just the ease of production is the, is the relative purity of the hydrocarbons. Uh, basically you get less reactive fuels consisting of uh, just hydrocarbons and like squiggly lines and polygons and they, just, they can have like the double bonds here and there maybe and things like that but we don't get other uh, more reactive uh, constituents like ketones or aldehydes or carboxylic acids or esters or just weird stuff like that and so the result is relatively unreactive and hydrophobic and and relatively clean 
burning fuel, which you can store for a very long time before it reacts with anything, you know, like itself or the atmosphere in a storage tank. And fame fuels, consisting of vessels of fatty acids and methanol, are really not that well behaved at all, but we'll get there in a second. As you can imagine, oil filtration can take a while, but we end up with a nice clear oil in the end, so, you know, who am I to complain? Okay, now that we have our reagents, let's prepare for the reaction. I dissolved 3.4 grams of potassium hydroxide into 100 milliliters of anhydrous uh, methanol. It is much easier to dissolve the base into the methanol instead of doing it later in the reaction vessel, so this makes the reaction kick off easier. We then pour the prepped methanol into half a liter of clear cooking oil. Uh, the oil and the methanol don't mix, so we get two clear phases with the methanol on top. Hence we need good stirring to make this work, as well as set up a reflux by putting a condenser on top and heating the system to somewhere between 55 and 65 degrees, you know, so that methanol, it doesn't necessarily need to boil, so I just heated the system to around about 55 or so degrees. Uh, I do recommend maintaining the condenser liquid nice and cold since methanol tends to be quite volatile, especially so close to its boiling point, and we don't want any of it to be lost. Plus, you know, it's very toxic to humans, so best to keep it inside the reaction vessel. While we look at these cool shots of the reaction slowly ramping up, let's talk about what we are making here, actually. As with other hydrocarbon fuels, fame also has a big chunk of its structure being a squiggly line. Uh, let's call this an alkyl group, which is attached to the methyl group via a nester link. In the ideal situation, this would be a very nice straight saturated squiggle, seeing how only one hydrogen is missing from the ester connection. But in reality, depending on the oil we, we use to make the fuel, we'll have different carbon double bonds on the fatty acids. And that's where the, the, you know, the yellow color of cooking oil comes from, is uh, the double bonds. Uh, and we, we, we know from reacting gasoline with an oxidizer that these double bonds are very prone to oxidation, uh, even in just regular atmospheric conditions, let alone with an oxidizer. Uh, oxygen just loves cleaving these double bonds to form like ketones, aldehydes and things like that. And these can later start reacting with each other as well, forming all kinds of complex polymers and other gunk that can be only described as tar, really. Uh, um, this plus the inherent instability of esters, especially to hydrolysis, you know, basically the opposite reaction of, of esterification, makes this type of biofuel you know, particularly susceptible to just spoiling. Uh, during auto-oxidation, it tends to separate into two phases, so this can happen even your, in, your, in your car tank. And one phase would be very thick and sticky, and not only gunking onto surfaces of the fuel line, but also like caking onto sensitive elements of the high pressure fuel injectors. And it decreases the efficiency of the, the, the fuel burning as well. I let the reaction go for around about three and a half hours, but in reality it seemed to have been finished, you know, earlier than that. After we let the product cool down and settle, we see that it forms two phases. Um, so uh, let's just move it to a separate ore funnel and explain what's happening. Uh, the top phase is our product, the biodiesel. It is still contaminated with, with the potassium hydroxide and probably some free fatty acids and, and probably some soaps. Uh, the bottom phase is also quite interesting in its own right because it is the, the it's glycerin basically. Uh, this is the backbone of the the fats and the oils that you find everywhere in in life on Earth. Uh, it's a very sought after ingredient in the, both the food and the pharmaceutical industries. I mean, so you, you could just purify this, uh, and as such, we can now drain the bottom phase, and maybe we can keep it to maybe make a video about you know purifying glycerin maybe later maybe. We now have half a liter of particularly nasty and contaminated uh, fame fuel, which we can purify using water and distilled hydrochloric acid. The water will draw out the, the potassium hydroxide as well as any unreacted methanol, uh, even though in our case we probably had an excess of oil, so the methanol should be all reacted. Uh, the hydrochloric acid helps additionally by reacting with the remaining uh, potassium hydroxide, which we only supposedly used as a as a catalyst and also importantly it, it will react with any soaps that may have been formed and soaps are quite nasty to have in a fuel so we want to get rid of them you know completely and uh, just to make sure i did the 
cleaning like at least three times or so uh, both with water and hydrochloric acid especially with the acid until it basically seemed like it stopped reacting and then I could just drain off the the fuel you know considering that esters can hydrolyze quite easily plus we don't really want uh, water in our fuel to begin with we want to get rid of any water that may be still trapped in here and to do that I just put an arbitrary amount of cal calcium chloride again and I left it to do its thing overnight. Uh, it, it did seem to do something this time uh, so this definitely wasn't a, a waste I, I think. We can now uh, vacuum filter the product while we, we talk about the one last aspect of this renewable diesel, uh, it's renewability. Uh, what I mean is, uh, yes, oil is technically a renewable resource, although the type of oil has to be chosen with some care because it has to uh, make a reasonably good fuel on one hand, but also there are agricultural aspects to this that need to be considered, land usage and uh, impact on soil, uh, I know, impact on, on biodiversity and things like that. That's actually a big topic that I'm not very informed on, but it's definitely something that needs to be considered. With that in mind, there is a bigger problem here. Uh, we just use methanol to make this fuel and methanol can be sustainably made using fermentation or from syngas for example, but most of the methanol nowadays is produced from natural gas, another non-renewable fuel source. So technically this renewable fuel fails at the very first requirement of sustainability. Don't use fossil fuels. Albeit this is a fixable problem since methanol can be produced sustainably, even by capturing like carbon dioxide from, from the atmosphere, something I really want to do by the way. So I'll give it a pass here. Regarding biodiesel's use as a fuel, I mean it's, it, it behaves a lot like diesel, it can bust much harder than say gasoline, it doesn't really evaporate much on its own, it is still thin enough to be used in a diesel engine. Uh, but it still needs all the things that a diesel engine uh, has, like systems that somehow prepare the fuel for combustion, either by uh, atomizing it at like lower pressures with a, with a fuel injector or like the higher pressures with a common rail engine, which, which improves the manual vaporization that, that you basically need for the diesel engine. And uh, just to test this, I add uh, dropwise a bit of the fuel onto a cotton ball, which, which should let it you know like increase its surface area a little bit and uh, allow it to heat up and mix with oxygen well enough to start burning once I introduce an open flame to the system. The problem with all of those engineering solutions though that you find in cars and in other engines that burn diesel is that they add to complexity to the complexity of the system which uh, as an engineering concept is, is a bad thing usually and as such these complex engines are often sensitive to the fuel in this case to like to any caking that can occur on the um, from fuel impurities for example just blocking fuel injectors or, or sometimes even the fuel lines and this is the reason why I want to look into the process of creating more stable and inert biofuel from from renewable oils um, this would involve the hydrogenation uh, of the of the fatty acids and fuel cracking both of these procedures are not very easily reproducible in a, the whole lab but it is far from impossible and with that being said now is the perfect opportunity for me to thank my patreon supporters who have already joined my newly created patreon i wasn't sure about making one but i have things that i want to do and make a video about but need help in acquiring tools and materials for so if you want me to do said things consider helping out with that you're smart you know where to find the links either way i thank you for watching this until the end and i'll see you in the next one